So, hello everybody, welcome. Um, I am the president of the French Society for Gene and Cell Therapy. And after a short summer break, we are continuing with our webinar series on gene editing and gene therapy. Today, uh, it will be Adrien Krug who will present. And he did his um, uh, studies at the University of uh, Nice in life sciences. Um, the current topic that he will present, though, is exactly his uh, master thesis under the supervision of Fred Bost and, uh, and actually myself uh, at the Citroën in Nice in France. And now he is finishing currently his, his PhD. He's in his very last days of, uh, of lab work here, in uh, or the last day, actually, in the University of Nice Citroën in France. And um, he will, uh, and this PhD is going, is about a completely different topic, uh, which is actually the, the identification of new therapies for peripheral T cell lymphomas. But today he will talk about gene editing and organoids. So I would like to also emphasize that this webinar is supported by Pfizer. Um, rare diseases, and um, now I give you the floor. Adrian, please. Thank you very much, Els. Thank you for this presentation, and thank you for allowing me to present this work that uh, I really like to do uh, during my master, and I, I continued a bit during my thesis. So, as you said, so it was a work that was done uh, in big part in uh, during my master uh, with Victor Tiroual, which was PhD students at this time and under uh, the supervision of Els and uh, Frédéric Bost here in the C3 m in Nice. So it's about the nanoblades that are a novel technology for efficient gene editing in urine and human uh, organoids. So first of all, uh, for gene editing, there are several ways to do it and several um, uh, ways. And one of them is, of course, the, the, the Cas9 technology um, that is uh, nanonuclease that will uh, cut with the, the, the help of a guide uh, RNA uh, DNA sequences. Um, but there are several ways to uh, deliver this Cas9 with the guide RNA uh, technology uh, into uh, cells. Um, and one of them, and one that is really used, is the lantiviral vectors. Um, but the main problem is that they can give low titers, since uh, we know that the Cas9 sequence with its guide yeah. RNA and their promoter um, can have um, a very uh, big, um, uh, uh, very big size, like uh, up to nine uh, kilo base, for example. Uh, but also it has some constitutive expression of Cas9 into the target cells that can lead to toxic immune response, a long-term expression of the Cas9. And of course, um, we can use some inintegrative uh, deficient lentiviral vectors, but it will lead to uh, not sufficient uh, expression levels uh, in the cells. So for that, we can use also the delivery of uh, ribonuclead uh, nucleoprotein, sorry, directly into the cells. So the Cas9 as a protein with its guide RNA as a whole complex uh, that can be done, for example, by electroporation, which is a technique very used, for example, in organoids like we will see. Um, but it also can lead to a high toxicity of the cells in the electroporation can be very, very harsh for the, uh, for the target cells. So for that, um, there is a technology that uh, was um, presented by uh, Els and that was done uh, really uh, well by uh, her team in Lyon with uh, Alejandra and uh, Severin, uh, which is the nanoblades, which are um, virus-like particles that contains um, the Cas9 and its guided RNA as a complex um, loaded directly into this uh, viral um, like particles. So the Cas9 is loaded as a protein uh, with its guide RNA. So it's a transient and safer delivery uh, than with the, the lantiviral vectors, for example. 
And we see that uh, to, to have these um, uh, nanoblades, we will have a um, uh, gag ball that is a complex of structural uh, protein uh, gag with uh, the pole, which is uh, enzymes like polymerase and um, integrase. Uh, we will have the gag that will be fused to the Cas9, again, as a protein, the gag RNA, and envelopes that will form the envelope of the uh, nanoblade. So uh, the gag that is fused to the Cas9 can have mainly two origins, the measles, uh, measles uh, the MLV uh, virus and the uh, HIV uh, virus. And once uh, integrated in the target cells, and the, um, uh, we have a protease site that can cleave this uh, site and um, uh, free the Cas9 that we can do its, uh, its work into the, the genome of the target cells. So to produce it, uh, basically, uh, we will have to put all these uh, ingredients. So as I said, the GAC pole, the GAC Cas9, the guide RNA, and the envelopes uh, with some trans uh, transfection reagents to help uh, this uh, entry into the, the, the cells. So it will be uh, producer cells, uh, mainly the 293T cells that we can use. Um, these elements will enter the nucleus and then form all the complexes uh, that will um, form the, the, the virus-like particle from these cells. So we will have the complex of the guide RNA with uh, the Cas9, but also the envelope um, uh, proteins that will be on the uh, um, uh, envelope of the, of the cells. And that will uh, eventually form uh, our uh, nanoblades that contains our Cas9 guide RNA complex. So the surface display of the viral envelopes are very important for the tropism, of course, uh, of the nanoblades. So this is why the pseudotyping, so it means the, the um, glycoproteins of the envelope of the, the, the nanoblade is very important. And it's something that is really used in antiviral vectors also. So one of the, the main pseudotype that is used is the VSVG from the, the, the stomatitis virus, uh, vesical stomatitis virus, um, that um, can have very high vector titers, uh, but also a high efficiency of packing and the stability of the vectors. But one of the big problem of the VSVG is that um, its receptor to enter the cells is the low density uh, lipoprotein that are not present in some key stem cells and some uh, naive immune cells, for example. So this is why there are other sort of types, like for example, uh, the, 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 the glycoproteins of the envelope of uh, baboon virus, and that we call uh, baboon envelope, or from uh, the envelope of the measles uh, virus. Uh, that have the H and F glycoproteins that are um, specific for the recognition of the cells and the fusion with the cells. So these, um, this pseudotype lead to uh, a better tropism to uh, T and B and hematopoietic stem cell, for example, but also a lower immune response and a less inactivation uh, by the complements that can be the case with the VSVG uh, pseudotyped um, vectors. So to know uh, the nanoblades, if they can be used with the VHVG or with the baboon envelope uh, that is uh, written here, BRL, um, the team so um, produced GFP nanoblades, so nanoblades that will contain uh, the Cas9 and its guard RNA directed against the GFP and um, with different um, pseudotyping. So either fully VHVG or with different ratio of VHVG and uh, baboon or fully baboon uh, envelope. And we see that they targeted, so obviously Im immortalized macrophages and uh, 293 T cells that were GFP positive. And we see that we have the better uh, gene editing with a uh, uh, one-to-one ratio of VSVG and BRL, so 50-50% of uh, each uh, of, uh, for the envelope uh, of the nanoblades. So after that, they also looked uh, for the, um, uh, the the better gag that can be used either, so as I said, for the MLV or the HIV, again with different uh, envelopes, VSVG or BRL, or the combination of both. And we see that we have a better concentration of the Cas9 uh, in the nanoblades that are um, uh, with the both uh, envelopes and under the gag MLV. 
So more precisely, when we look, for example, at the, the Wiskott Aldrich uh, syndrome, uh, that is uh, that is a syndrome that leads to uh, an immune deficiency uh, li um, linked to uh, the X chromosome um, under the, 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 the WAS gene. Um, so they tried to use two different guide RNAs that um, target two, uh, two regions of the gene uh, around the first exon of the gene. Um, we see that on a region that can be uh, closed by two primers and seen uh, after by PCR, a region that can be up to 800 base pair. Normally, when we use our two guide RNA, we will have a cleavage of this region between the two guide RNA and will lead to a 600 base pair region. So we can see by uh, by PCR the efficiency of the cleavage uh, with uh, our guide RNAs again with the two envelopes or the gag from the MLV or the HIV, and we see that we have a better um, uh, gene editing with uh, up to sixty percent approximately um, with the the baboon plus uh, VHVG um, uh, envelopes, uh, and again we can see here. Uh, again, with the MLV uh, gag. So knowing all of that, we want, we want to know if this technology can be used in organoids to do some genetic engineering uh, with our nanoblade. So this was a project uh, that we done with Victor and Emma here in the lab under the supervision of Els and uh, Fred. So what basically are organized, first of all? So they are 3D uh, in vitro culture system that can be derived from um, self-organizing stem cells. And they can, they can recapitulate the in vivo functionality, the genetic signature, and uh, the architecture sometimes of the original tissue. Like we, say, we can see here examples of the prostate and uh, the liver. So they can be used uh, in different ways to, for, at, uh, for different goals. For example, uh, recapitulating patient uh, pathology. Uh, they can also be used for host microbe interaction like did the, the team of clevers that injected um, um, bacteria into colon uh, organoids to see the pathogenicity of this uh, bacteria, for example. Uh, they can be used also for biobanking and drug screening, or even for a model of tissue of growth and homeostasis. But in our case, we will stick to the uh, functionality of recapitulating the patient's uh, pathology. So in our case, we will use mainly uh, the prostate uh, organoid. So the prostate is an organ that is localized only in male uh, mammals, that is localized just under the, the bladder and that is composed with uh, several glands and its role uh, the role of the prostate is to produce and secrete the, the, the seminal fluid that will be done uh, by these uh, glands that are present all over the organ so the gland have a specific um, uh, structure that is with two cell layers. We have an external cell layer with that we call the basal layer that's composed by the basal cells here in yellow that have an architecture role of maintaining the structure of uh, the gland. We have also in the cell layer, the adult stem cells that will uh, differentiate themselves into the other uh, cell types. And we have this, the, the luminal layer uh, with the luminal cells that have the role of producing and secreting directly in the lumen of the gland, the seminal fluid. So, as I said, we have these adult stem cells that are present and that can, uh, that have this uh, auto-renewing uh, capacity, but also to uh, differentiate themselves into the basal cells and the luminal cells. And what puts uh, in vitro in good condition uh, which means uh, under matrigel and growth factors, we will see that we will have the growth of organoid of prostate that will uh, have the same structure at the gland uh, in the uh, organ in vivo. So this will be our main model of genetic manipulation and we will use it to try to do some uh, knockout with our Cas9 model with our nanoblades. So for now, this is something that is also uh, really done to do some um, CRISPR-Cas9 on organoids with different techniques, for example, electroporation, liposome transfection, antivirus. But for example, electroporation, that is the main way to do it. It's something that 
lead to very, very high toxicity. As I said earlier, that can lead to, to be very harsh to, this, uh, to the cells. So we have a very, very poor efficiency of uh, the gene editing in the organoids with the electroporation. So we wanted to know if the nanoblades could be a better option with a lower toxicity, like it's the case with hematopoietic stem cells, for example, to see if we can be used for our organoids. So we first tested with our prostate organoids that were expressing the GFP. So we had our organoids uh, GFP positive that we dissociated uh, to have uh, single cells that we incubated with our nanoblades that contain the Cas9 again as a protein and the guide RNA targeting the GFP gene. So after uh, incubation, we seeded our cells into matrogen and growth factor to, so they can give back uh, new organoids that should be normally for some of them knocked out. And indeed, when we looked uh, by uh, microscopy, optical microscopy, we see that when we have no nanoblade, we have a high rate of uh, green GFP positive organoids. But when we put uh, the nanoblade anti GFP, we see that we don't have a big difference into the number of cells visually, but we have really, really a decrease of GFP positive cells. And when we look by flow cytometry, we see that we have up to 70% of uh, GFP knockouts in uh, organoids, something that can be uh, seen also um, augmenting in a dose dependent manner uh, with the Cas9 uh, protein levels. So, Again, with our uh, nanoblade, we didn't have any toxicity as we saw by microscopy. We don't have any toxic toxicity on our uh, organoid cells since we don't have any change in the percentage of living cells in the condition with no nanoblades um, and also in the condition with the nanoblades 24 or even 48 hours after. But also we have no reduction of organoid numbers when we look, when we counted them. We didn't have any difference uh, when the, the organoids were without nanoblades or with the nanoblades anti-GFP. And also the area of the organoids uh, didn't change where, with or without uh, nanoblades. And also, which is really important, we didn't uh, modify the structure of the organoids. We still, even with the nanoblades, have this um, B layer of cells that recapitulate again very well the structure of uh, the organ that was not changed uh, with the uh, nanoblades. So it means that it has no toxicity or good efficiency with the GFP uh, at least. So, we want to go uh, more on uh, more important gene more uh, that can be used by the uh, organ or organoids. And for the prostate, uh, we know that the prostate is a very dependent uh, organ on hormones. So for example, on the dehydrotestosterone, um, that can, be, can go and link itself to the androgen receptor that will lead to a proper um, prostate development, so either prostate gland or prostate uh, organoid. And we see here that without the DHT, we have very compact organoids. We don't have these two cell layers. We don't have any lumen anymore uh, compared to the condition where we have DHT that is necessary for the development uh, of the gland. So we know that with the presence of an inhibitor uh, of the androgen receptor to cut this link between the T DHT and uh, to see if it maybe have an impact on the um, uh, development of the gland. And indeed, with the inhibitor, even in presence uh, of DHT, we see that we have, again, this phenotype of very compact organoids without any lumen and without this um, B layer that we had. So we uh, decided that the androgen receptor was a good target for gene editing uh, with our nanoblades. So we used two different guide RNAs uh, that I will call uh, guide RNA 1 and 2 on our uh, AR gene. And uh, we saw that uh, one gene was working more than another. Um, so the, the guide RNA 2 was had a better um, uh, efficiency uh, than the one uh, towards our prostate organoids, up to 30% of indels that we saw. And the combination of both didn't uh, increase this uh, percentage of indels. 
When we looked again at the number of organoids, we see that we don't have any changes in the organoids that were wall types, so with no nanoblades, or with the first guide, the second guide, or even with the combination of two guides, we didn't have any changes in the number of organoids. And when we look at the structure this time, so this time we want to see a, a, a disturbance of the structure of uh, the uh, organoids. So we see that the wild types are very wide with this lumen and um, by marking, we see that we have these nice two cell layers that are disappearing with the um, nanoblades uh, targeting the uh, androgen receptor. And we see that we have, again, this very compact phenotype compar uh, compared to, um, really similar, sorry, to uh, the uh, and, um, organoids that didn't have any dehydrotestosterone. So after that, we went to human prostates. Uh, so all the work before was on um, urine prostates. And now we want to look if on human prostate, we can have some similar results. So again, we, start, uh, we first started with uh, GFB organoids. And we see that we have also a high um, gene addition with uh, our um, uh, GFP organoids with our nanoblades targeting GFP, and we see again that is uh, augmenting on a dose-depending uh, manner of the Cas9 protein. Again, uh, we have no differences into the organoid uh, counts uh, with our nanoblades, uh, not depending on the Cas9 protein levels. And we don't have, again, uh, a difference in the structure of the organoids. So we have here all the marking of DAPI, so the, uh, the, the, nuclei, uh, the nuclei of the cells, STOM20 for uh, the, the, the mitochondria, the phalloidin for the cytoskeleton. Uh, we see that we don't have any differences in the structure of both organoids uh, without or with uh, anti-GFP nanoblades. So after that, we went to another model of organoids, which was the colon organoids, again with uh, the GFP. And again, we saw that we have a pretty good um, uh, addition of the, uh, of the GFP cells with uh, the organoids uh, that went up to 60% of uh, gene addition. And we compared this time uh, nanoblades to uh, the electroporation. And we see that with the electroporation, we didn't have a really, really good, so it was significant compared to the control, but we didn't have as good as the nanoblade uh, of um, extinction of the GFP gene. And which is more important is that um, when we look at the percentage of live cells, we see that with the nanoblade, we don't have any difference compared to the control. But when we look at the electroporation, we see that we have up to 50% of the organoids that were dead and didn't survive to the electroporation. So again, the nanoblade is a way more safer um, uh, uh, manner to introduce the RNPs into the target cells. And again, this is the structure that we had after uh, transduction of the cells with the nanoblades. So um, after that, we went on another gene that is really important in the human colon uh, organoids, that is the CFTR, um, that uh, the, the mutation of the CFTR is known uh, to do the cyst uh, cystic fibrosis, for example. So it's a gene that is uh, present on the colon cells and that is uh, really important. And we used uh, nanoblades targeting uh, the human CFTR in our human organoids, and we see that we had a higher percentage of, um, uh, of uh, indels, up to 20% uh, in our organoids. And when we look at the organoid counts, uh, again, when we compared the control with nanoblade anti-GFP or anti-CFTR, we didn't have any changes or even more organoids uh, after um, the incubation with our nanoblades. So to go back to the table that I showed before, we see that we have our nanoblades that bring a better uh, efficiency in organoids. For example, with electroporation, we had up to 25% of um, trans uh, of um, sorry gene editing, where in the nanoblades we have between 30 and 80% of uh, editing, and we have very very low to no toxicity in our cells with the delivery of the RNPs directly into the uh, target cells. 
So this is uh, something that we can do with uh, the following workflow. And we see that this is something that's going to be done in like uh, one month from the cloning guide RNA to the genotyping. So our gene addition with the nanoblades ensures several things like a rapid transfer of the Cas9 uh, RNP. Uh, we have no de delivery of coding material since the Cas9 is as a protein and the guide RNA as an RNA. We have very low of targets, very low toxicity, and we have a multiplexing of single guide RNA that can also be done. So I would like to thank all the persons that were involved in this work. So of course, Victor, Els, and Frédéric, but also all the persons in the C3M, the VIB, the Ebrecht Institute, and the Siri and the NS that uh, did an, an amazing job and that helped us a lot with, uh, with this work. So if you are very interested, yeah, there is also this paper that we published so this year about the efficiency of the nanoblades into murine and human organoids. So all the work that I presented here is presented there. And of course, I invite you to look at the work of uh, Alejandra that um, uh, so did, to look at the nanoblades more into the, the hematopoietic uh, cells, uh, so stem cells, T and B cells. And she also presented the webinar here uh, with the SCFTCG. And I gladly in, invite you to, to look at it. So thank you very much for your uh, presence and listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Adrian. This was a very clear uh, presentation, I would say. Um, can you just summarize uh, for us maybe again um, how, uh, what is the um, advantage of using the nanoblades as a delivery system um, for, uh, for organoids? What is to you, the 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 most important aspects um, that are important. What do you think? Yeah, well, for me, the main aspect that is important of these uh, nanoblades on the organoids will be the toxicity. So, as I said, the electroporation was the main uh, technique used to deliver the RNPs into the cells. But we see that since we work for organoids on stem cells that are very fragile, the uh, electroporation can be very harsh to them and can lead to uh, a lot of killing of the cells, as I showed uh, earlier with our colon uh, organoids. And uh, with even there are, I think there are organoids like uh, from breast. That yeah, exactly. That was what I fragile. was going to say. Yeah, we we worked also in uh, with breast organoids that are, are really really fragile, and we had almost no cells left, uh, no cells left with the um, electroporation, while the nanoblades worked uh, very well. And of course, uh, more than the delivery uh, with the nanoblades, we uh, ensure. Um, uh, the delivery of the Cas9 and as an RNP, so we don't have any insertion of uh, the, the gene of the Cas9, so we don't, it's a hit and run signal, so it's really the Cas9 is really transient in the cells, so it doesn't bring any more toxicity also. Okay, okay. And um, then maybe it's not so clear for, for everybody, uh, what would be the different applications of the nanoblades in the context of, of organoids, do you think? Yeah, actually, there are several. So as we did here, for example, with uh, different genes to look at the importance of genes in the development of organoids and maybe in organs, like we saw with the uh, androgen receptor gene, for example, or the CFTR gene with the colon organoids, that can be very interesting to look at uh, this, the importance of uh, this kind of genes. But also, um, to we can use it also to, to do some knocking, for example, of other genes. So the nanoblades will permit the cutting of the DNA, but we can bring also a template DNA to, to tag, for example, uh, a certain protein with uh, uh, genes like the GFP, for example, um, under, uh, for example, the promoter, uh, endogenous promoter uh, of the protein. But also, uh, we could uh, imagine to do some um, gene editing on uh, a gene a deficient gene or a mutated gene that we can uh, cut and knock in with uh, a good version of it, if I may say. Okay, perfect. And um, what do you think? Is this something that you can 
only use um, ex vivo or could you use, for example, for therapy, maybe uh, these nanoblades also uh, in vivo? But yeah, of course, the in vivo would be the main goal. And so this is something that uh, has been done once in the Philippe Mangeau's paper, um, that, but in liver cells. But of course, uh, so we, we tried here with the organoids, but the main goal would be to go in vivo, to do some gene editing in vivo. But also, like I said earlier, with the pseudotyping so of uh, the nanoblades, it would be interesting also to 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 look if we can re redirect uh, the targeting of the nanoblades to have more specific uh, targeting of specific uh, cells. That could be very interesting also to do uh, to go in vivo. Yeah, like for T cells, for example. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So um, I have one question from yeah. the chat still. Um, thank you very much for a very clear presentation. He says, um, Jean-Baptiste Dupont, uh, have you been able to observe an, um, mosaic organoids? So he means that they are not completely edited. Yeah, not really, because uh, what we do is that uh, when we do the gene editing is that we edit not the whole organoid like we could do with the electroporation where, where we electropore the whole organoid where some cells could be uh, could have the Cas9 and some uh, doesn't. Here we edit just um, the stem cells at the basis. So when it will be edited, it will differentiate into cells that are edited. So once okay. the well, organoids that are all edited from one cells that will be uh, that we will edit actually. And uh, I think in in the publication we actually uh verify that right by yeah. picking yeah. individual um yeah. zones for for verifying that there was not a 50 percent editing of one single uh organoid it was also yeah. always 100 percent. but i think you agree with me if you there are organoids that you cannot uh that don't have stem cells which will give all the tissues and that will be more problematic to homogeneously edit the whole uh, of organoid. Course. So and especially with organoids, we like, need to be... especially with organoids like the prostates that, that have two cell layers. So, for example, the second cell layer would be more difficult to access with the nanoblades. So, yeah, I agree with you. So, I think there is um, no more. Uh, there's one other question. How can we explain the superior efficacy of particles with a mix of envelope proteins compared to those with only one or other envelope? Yeah, I would say that when we combine the two envelopes, we take the advantages of both envelopes. Like, for example, uh, as I said, the VSVG, uh, allow a high titer and is uh, really not specific and goes on a lot of cells with the um, low density uh, lipoproteins, while the baboon envelope goes and uh, goes with a CT transporter, which is an amino acid transporter. So I think that when we combine the both envelopes, we can go and go on the cells that express uh, either the one or the other or both, but we can access to more cells maybe than just with one or another. Yeah, I think I think this would be one of the aspects, but what we what you have actually shown is that we have more Cas9 incorporated and that will yeah. explain, of course. Yeah, also. Yeah. And unfortunately, uh, we must admit that the reason the exact reason why that is that you have with the double pseudotyping more Cas9 associated with the guide RNAs um, into these particles, uh, we have no real explanation for that. We only yeah. know that it's the case. That <laughs> and, was more uh, speculation for my part than. <laughs> so I think um, we have no more questions as I can see. So, Adrian, thank you very much. You also have. 
a very uh, nice con congratulations from the chat. And um, I um, I thank everybody for for watching. We will have uh, uh, other another webinar coming up in in October. Uh, which will be uh, more uh, focused on the production of lentiviral vectors and AV vectors for clinical uh, purposes. So upscaling of those uh, therapies, which is really sometimes a, a bottleneck. And um, I will give a bit more details on the, on the website uh, soon about that. Thank you very much and uh, hope to, to, to see you all soon. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.